Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back from your break. Uh, can we invite you to please take your seats for the final session today? We'd like to welcome the Deputy Minister of Health in Malaysia, the Honorable Dr. Lee Boonchai. Thank you for joining us. May I ask to give a round of applause to Mr. Charles Goddard, please, because I think he did a wonderful job as the moderator or mediator. Thank you very much. And um, it's time almost for the closing of today's session, the World Cancer Leaders Summit. And it's my great pleasure now to introduce Dr. Christopher P. Wild, the director of the International Agency for Research on Cancer, talk about reducing the global cancer burden. Failure is success in progress. Okay, well, thank you very much for that introduction and also for coming back promptly after the, the coffee. I, I normally like to move around a bit while I'm speaking, but the narrowness of this podium could lead me to a very undignified end. So I will stay uh, planted where I am and uh, give you a few thoughts. And, you know, I find it a very encouraging meeting. Of course, the, the content is good. The, the networking is excellent. But actually, I was trying to identify what really gives me the satisfaction of being here. And I, I think it's just being in a room with 350 or so people that have a similar objective in life. Uh, and that's a great encouragement, actually. I think, it, I hope it sends you back encouraged as well. Kerry um, asked me to give these closing remarks, and I said, well, wh what do you want me to speak about? And he said, well, just talk about what IARC's done over the last 10 years. That should take you about 10 minutes. <laughs> So I thought how much I've been missing the British sense of humor. Um, I decided not to talk about what IARC's been doing for 10 years, but I've been at the agency for 10 years as director, and I'll be stepping down at the end of this year. So I thought what I would do is just give you 10 things, 10 points that I think are important to bear in mind as we close down this meeting and we move on in our various uh, professional areas. And I chose this title, subtitle, Failure is Success in Progress. This is a phrase, a saying, a quote attributed to Albert Einstein. And I, I quite like this. I couldn't find where he originally said it, but it's attributed to him. And I'll explain why I think it's appropriate as I go along. So uh, 10 statements I will make, loosely supported by a few slides. The first one is cancer is a disease of uncontrolled growth. I mean, this is true at the molecular level, the cellular level, but it's also true at the population level. Freddie Bray this morning showed you this projection. I don't need to dwell on this. Uh, these, these stark uh, reminders of what we face. We can see this coming in the next two decades. But I want to show you what success looks like because it's in some ways even more sobering. What you've got on this slide in the, in the line bar, the line, sorry, is the reduction in lung cancer incidence rates in the UK among males over, projected forward over about a 40-year period. So you can see that we're on the right downward track. That's been going on for a number of years, and it's projected to drop still further. So this is success in terms of meeting 25 by 25, or the SDG target. The bars are the total number of lung cancer patients projected in the UK over the same period. And that's going up, and that's, as Freddie explained this morning, due to the demographic, the aging of the population. So I think it's really important that we bear in mind that when we look at these targets, that they're focused on rates, and these need to be considered also in terms of absolute burden of disease when we're planning health services provision and investing in prevention and early detection. So we need action on cancer control now, of course, ever more urgently. Second statement, uh, cancer is a disease of difference. I mean, it's, I think we reported in Globocan on more than 35 different cancer sites ar around the body. 
within those cancer sites, there are different cell types that are affected, and there are different molecular pathways which lead to those cancers. But again, also at the population level, cancer is a disease of difference. This is a, just a map, a world map. The darker the colors here, the greater the proportion of cancers attributable to infections. So if you look in parts of sub-Saharan Africa, more than one in three cancers linked to chronic infection. North America and Australia, it's, it's one in 30. If you do a similar mapping exercise, so bringing together here the global burden of cancers with the prevalence of risk factors, here you see high BMI and its contribution. You see almost the opposite picture, very large contribution in North America, parts of Europe, and uh, much less in Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. So the consequence of this is while we have these global targets, we very much must tailor cancer control priorities to the local setting. And this is why having registry data at national level is so important. Third, cancer is a disease plagued by inequalities. I mean, certainly as I art director traveling to different parts of the world, this becomes very quickly evident. Let me just give you two examples. This is uh, female breast cancer, incidence in blue and mortality rates in red. So from the blue bars, you can see the huge heterogeneity in incidence by world region. But the red bars look remarkably similar in size. And what that's telling us is that a woman that develops breast cancer in Western Europe has a completely different prognosis than one in Central Africa or parts of Asia. So this is a, an enormous inequality in breast cancer survival. We also see similar things within populations, you know, within a country. There's been some very interesting collaborative work with, with the agency and partners in, uh, in Canada, US, Australia, and New Zealand comparing cancer rates in the indigenous versus non-indigenous populations. I've put one slide up here just for illustration, showing the, the markedly different cervical cancer incidence rates in the indigenous populations in, in some of these countries compared to non-indigenous. So when we're looking at cancer control, we must make sure that we reach all parts of a, of, of a population, all parts of a society. And in fact, I would go further and say that every cancer control measure should at least be evaluated on whether it's going to, on how it's going to impact on inequalities. Is it going to decrease them or is it going to increase inequalities within a country and globally? Cancer is costly to health, economies, and societies. I mean, I, I pick three illustrations here. In India, this has been mentioned already, the, the devastating out-of-pocket expenses burden that falls on the households with a cancer case. But there are other ways of looking at this. We, we work quite closely with colleagues in Ireland, Alison Pierce, on productivity loss in the BRICS countries. And just estimated for one year, just the loss to the economy of taking people out of that economy. So it's not healthcare treatment costs. This is just loss of people from the workforce. You know, 46 billion US dollars across those five countries. And then at the bottom, I looked because we're moving, moving to, I'm moving to Australia next week, cost of anti-cancer drugs in Australia. You know, 19% per annum increase in anti-cancer drug costs over a 10 or 12 year period. I mean, this is really unsustainable. One of the lessons I've learned during my time at IARC is the value of coupling economic analyses on cancer to the sorts of analysis we do on the health burden. I mean, these numbers speak loudly, but they're often far less well developed than, than, than our work on health endpoints. You know, 30 years ago, I remember going to cancer conferences and the health economists almost had to have bodyguards to come in and out of the meeting. Such was the unpopularity 
expressed towards people who put financial figures onto health statistics, onto lives. Uh, this has changed, and I think this is persuasive. You know, cancer is increasingly drawing political attention, and I'm not going to trawl through these dates, these important meetings. I think most of you are aware of these. But, you know, attention is not the same as commitment, and commitment is not equivalent to action. And I think WHO's leadership in this area has been exemplary in, in driving this NCD and, and cancer agenda forward. But the role of civil society in keeping the pressure on has been equally important. And I think we must continue collectively to hold to account those responsible through reliable measurements of progress. Cancer needs scientific evidence-based policies. Um, there are relatively few scientists, actually, that are willing to cross this rickety bridge between the research that they do and trying to bring that into the policy arena and influence change. Um, and some of the language is quite interesting to me in, in recent years. This is actually the WHO European Health Report that just came out. And there's this statement in there, evidence-informed rather than evidence-based health policy acknowledges you know, that policy-making is, is inherently a political process. And that's certainly true. But I would say as a scientist, I will fight as hard as possible to strengthen the case based on scientific evidence. I understand the rest of the criteria will come into play, but as scientists, at least, we must force as far as possible the consideration of the scientific evidence. And I, I think more scientists must be willing to cross this bridge, but they must carry with them something useful that can be used on the other side. You know, we need to learn how to communicate our research in the policy domain. Otherwise, it will not be translated into practice. Cancer needs long-term targets. Uh, these are a couple of examples in the UK and Poland of policy interventions. The, the two bottom lines are the smoking rates and the two top curves are the lung cancer mortality. I mean, the details do not matter. What matters is the time scale. I mean, this is several decades. So I think we must be careful to avoid, at least in the cancer field, being driven by short-term goals, or indeed purely by the large numbers. You know, there are some aspects of cancer, like occupational cancers, that can be solved by better practices in the workplace. These will not show up on the global burden of cancer estimates, but they're vital for the small number of people in those industries that have a high and unacceptable risk. Cancer needs more development assistance for health. This is work of IHME in uh, Seattle, Washington. Many of you will know these numbers. You know, NCDs accounting for nearly 70% of all deaths, yet only receiving 2% of the funding to improve health in low- and middle-income countries. Remember, the 2% is all of NCDs, not cancer. So there is a gap between what we know about the science, what we're coming to understand as a political priority, and the assist, de development assistance for health, which is lagging way behind. But in making a plea for an increased investment from that sector, I think we need a clearer planning from the cancer community on what would be done with the additional financing. We've been speaking today around the human resources, around the technology, uh, but also around the investment that's needed within the country to complement this kind of external funding. Cancer needs more research investment in prevention. This is uh, the work of ICRP, this um, cooperation between different funders that 
24 partners now, 129 funding organizations, 50 billion US dollars since 2000 invested in cancer research. It's heavily skewed, I have to say, by the, by the USA, uh, Canada, the UK, Australia. But you can see the prevention segment is 7%. I think this is reasonably typical, if not actually slightly higher than many national investment profiles. You see the huge investment in the basic biology and new treatment developments for cancer. So if we're serious about developing new preventive interventions, we need the evidence. And to get the evidence, we need the, the research investment. And this is unlikely to come from the private sector. I mean, there's probably not enough incentive in preventive interventions to make that work. So it seems to me this is a challenge to government, cancer research funding, and NGO funding to, to, to balance this out. And I think all cancer research funders should aim for a balanced portfolio to reflect the priorities that we speak about in terms of cancer control measures. So I'm coming to a close in a second. I mean, cancer needs a balanced, integrated, and equitable approach. And there's been a few people that have affected me in my career. In a, well, there's been a lot of people that have affected me, but there's been a few that have affected me very positively. And one of these was Dennis, uh, Dennis Burkett, who was a, a bush surgeon in Uganda, you know, in the 50s, 60s. And actually, of course, he, he used to talk about being a very dedicated mopper. He was a medical doctor, a surgeon. He said he spent 18 hours a day mopping the water up, solving the problems of health. And then he had this thought about maybe switching off the tap, you know, in order to reduce the water on the floor. And of course, he, he described the occurrence of what's now known as Burkitt lymphoma. He helped identify a cause of the disease. That would be a foundation to prevention. And he also developed an affordable and effective treatment using cyclophosphamide, what he had available, what was affordable in Uganda at the time. And I think this is a very nice example of moving from description to understanding to change. And he was quite a, a remarkable uh, advocate for, for this kind of application of research in practice. So a few wild cards to finish. Failure is success in progress. The number of reliable cancer registries is increasing. Freddie Bray showed that this morning. But the major gaps remain, particularly in LMICs, and there's underfunding. There is more emphasis being placed on prevention and implementation. I hear this more and more frequently at cancer meetings. But for many cancers, we still have little knowledge of the causes. And for others, we don't know how to intervene. I mean, we talk a lot about obesity and overweight. But there's relatively little evidence base for effective population interventions. Cancer biology promises major benefits in early detection and precision medicine, but actually this may lead to greater inequalities. I mean, I have a kind of schizophrenia in some ways. When I go to the leading cancer research meetings, I don't see the same people that are at this type of meeting. You know, those meetings are all about the latest advances in therapies, immunotherapy, new precision medicines. So there is still some gap in the cancer community in this respect. And finally, you know, NCD targets uh, actually can be met without major progress on cancer. Um, if you bring down cardiovascular disease from a high level in your country, you can meet the NCD target without affecting cancer. So I think for the cancer community, this is something we have to think closely about going forward. I mean, it's certainly important for this to be integral to NCD priorities. But there's also something different about cancer that needs attention beyond those initial targets. So I've given you 10 observations about cancer. I think the scientific evidence base is strong, and we can improve it further. The political commitment now is growing. I think there's still this gap with the investment in developer assistance for health. These are a few, few thoughts from a few years in an international cancer research agency. And uh, 
thank you for your attention and also, more importantly, for the collaboration of so many people with the agency over this uh, last few years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Christopher Wilde. And now it's my honor and pleasure to call back to the podium Her Royal Highness Princess Dina Mered to voice the call for action. Good evening, everyone. Before I start, I just want to say to Dr. Chris Wilde, he always steals my joke when he comes before me, and he's done it a couple of times, and now he had all these amazing slides. It's not fair, <laughs> you know? Next time, I'm going to be armed with that bridge slide that you had over here. Um, I just came back from the UN high-level meeting where I gave the keynote speech on behalf of all civil society as eminent champion of NCTs. Before I went to New York, in preparation of my speech, I actually, for the first time, struggled to write. When I looked back at my UN high-level speech in 2011, I felt like I could just whip up the speech again and reread it. The same speech, as many of the arguments still held and so little progress took place since then. So in my new speech, I simply focused on reminding and urging governments to merely deliver, deliver on the promises given in 2011 and subsequently in 2014. And as Dr. Chris Wilde said, commitments are very different than action. We just want governments to actually deliver because we in civil society have done all we can. We framed our argument in so many ways as a health issue, as an economic issue, as an investment issue. There was no more reframing. The tools are at our disposal, but we need governments to start acting. So although the political declaration of 2018 does not move us much further than those of 2011 and 2014, but and we have to remember it is a compromise document after all, forged between 150 plus countries. So in some ways, it is no surprise. You will have the odd country here and there wanting to dilute this and add a comma here and change the document. It's a big negotiation. Uh, scheme at the UN level. However, this should not stop us. Whether we are civil society or governments on national levels, we should continue marching forth with our own commitments and resolution to meet the life-saving targets. After all, we still have the knowledge and tools at our disposal to push forward actions. And most importantly, we still have the responsibility to protect our people against non-communicable diseases, including cancer. After all, governments are in the driving seat, and they need to steer us to safety. One item that came out of the political resolution that was progressive and certainly unequivocal in its ambition was the call to action to eliminate cervical cancer by Dr. Tedros. As we stand today, the majority of women in the world still await in trepidation the lottery of infection with total helplessness. A lottery that unfortunately delivers great chance of success in this case. And the statistics are telling. Every two minutes, a woman dies from this devastating disease. Nine of every 10 of those women is in a low and or middle income country. And this cancer is particularly devastating in, H in communities living with HIV. Just think for a moment, every two minutes, a woman dies from this devastating disease. So I want to applaud Dr. Tedros, Director General of WHO, for not just being dissatisfied with global action plans and vocal commitments, he is going all out against cervical cancer calling for elimination of cervical cancer. Not probable elimination or potential elimination, just pure 
elimination, thereby sending a bold, clear, and unambiguous message of hope to all women and cervical cancer sufferers all over the world that their cries of help have been heard and that the global community has decided to now unequivocally and audaciously do something about it. And it is in the doing that we can save lives. It is in the doing. We must harness the knowledge and tools we have to prevent, screen, and treat cervical cancer and ensure that these are scaled up into national programs. We must ensure that HPV vaccination is affordable and accessible in countries and settings. We must increase the coverage of screening services linked to treatment so that all women with a positive screening result for precancerous lesions receive prompt treatment and for those with, with invasive cancer, a referral to specialized facilities for treatment and care, including pain relief and palliative care. We must ensure that interventions to eliminate cervical cancer are available to women regardless of who they are, where they are, and their ability to pay. Note here, it is the three things. It is the vaccination, the early detection, the screening, and the treatment. As a health minister in Thailand, when I was in New York, explained, and they have really succeeded in certainly in screening of cervical cancer, he said, which was very true, that vaccination, of course, is super important, but the results are 20 years plus time. But if you really want to reduce mortality now, you also have to do early detection and screening. And this is what happened um, in Thailand. We must set up population-based cancer surveillance systems to track our efforts, see where greater resources are required, and make sure that nobody is left behind. If we do these things, we can achieve our goal to make cervical cancer a disease of the past and not of the future. We can achieve that. But why stop there? In many countries, most people with cancer are not diagnosed early enough and lack access to life-saving treatment. This is not just true of cervical cancer, but for other cancers as well, such as breast cancer, colorectal cancer, childhood cancers, that if detected early, can be successfully treated. Let us use the momentum from the campaign for the elimination of cervical cancer to build the health systems we need to reduce deaths from other high burden cancers. And I want to stress here the word system. I strongly believe that many of our health issues that we face today are very much linked to our non-comprehensive and non-systematic approaches to health. Our traditional approach has long been extremely narrow, disease-based, acute care-based, and built on vertical systems that do not encourage cross-cutting synergies. Had the core of our strategy and approach be based on people, or rather the human, as one indivisible unit growing from the uterus to old age, with the understanding of the health risks faced in this life course optic, then we would not be where we are today. We would not have had the perennial competition between diseases that exist today, the either-or syndrome, NCDs versus CDs, male versus female health issues, the young versus the old, nor would we have ignored the most neglected scourge of our times, mental health illnesses. As Princess Nono mentioned today, we should all be advocates for the whole body. So let us improve access to diagnosis and treatment of cancer at its earliest stage and ensure that cancer services are embedded in health systems from primary care level through to tertiary services as part and parcel of achieving universal health coverage. If universal health coverage ignores prevention and early detection as part of the coverage, then universal health coverage will be an empty shell. Equally, if universal health coverage ignores quality of care, then it will fail to deliver its noble ambitions. But how to successfully engage with our governments? How to convince them to invest in improved access to cancer services, given all the competing priorities? How to create a strong 
national cancer movement to be reckoned with. Well, on World Cancer Day earlier this year, UICC launched its global advocacy campaign called Treatment for All. It is a global campaign that is calling worldwide for equitable access to cancer services for all peoples to save lives. But it is also a local campaign supporting countries on the ground on how to articulate the investment needed to achieve this ambition. Treatment for all calls for investment in accurate cancer data and population-based cancer registries. Cannot emphasize that enough. You need to know where the gaps are. You need to know where you are to be able to do something about it. Early detection and timely diagnosis. Quality treatment, including radiotherapy, surgery, chemotherapy, and access to essential medicines. Quality of life, including supportive and palliative care. So we call on all governments, civil society, international organizations, and private sector partners to invest in treatment for all advocacy campaign so we can unite and amplify our demands as one big force with one ask and one voice. As part of the national activation of Treatment for All advocacy campaign, UICC member organizations are invited to express their interest in becoming one of the selected organizations to champion national advocacy efforts in the respective countries. We look forward to talking more about the campaign's progress at the next World Cancer Leaders Summit, which will be held in Almaty, Kazakhstan. The theme of which is cancer and universal health coverage. And now, it is my great pleasure to introduce a short film about Treatment for All, where you will see Treatment for All advocacy being brought to life through our, the work of our members and partners in countries around the world. Thank you. UICC is a membership organisation, so everything we do is for our members who are cancer organisations around the world. Our ambition is to reduce the cancer burden by bringing those communities together uh, to address inequity around the world because not everyone has access to cancer treatment and care. I, I think the, the world is not understanding the magnitude of a problem related to cancer. And many member states are already asking WHO for support. That momentum is really growing and we have to push harder because cancer is already one of the major causes of morbidity and mortality. We know that each country is different and we rely on our membership engaging with us to make sure that the agenda that's set for that country is owned by our members, owned by that government. And then our responsibility is to provide them with the skill sets, the resources, what they need to take it from where they are to where they want to be. So Treatment for All is about raising the profile of cancer treatment and care. The Treatment for All campaign, advocacy campaign, you know, resonates around four pillars. They, they really cover the continuum of care from where we want to diagnose early that someone has a cancer. Secondly, we want to get them into quality treatment to make sure they have a really good chance of actually surviving cancer. And of course, we want to make sure that palliative care is in place. And under all of that, we have to have data and information. We've been working with the World Health Organization to deliver a cancer resolution. And of course that cancer resolution really pivots around cancer treatment and care. Treatment for All at its core is about people. The people behind organizations like Indonesian Cancer Foundation, like Salvati, and like Uganda Cancer Society. It's helping us to focus and to know how to go about the path, the direction. And then we get advice also from the UICC and from the UICC members about how they are dealing with the problem. We are learning so much of how they do it, so we hope to do it quickly, uh, to help more patients. It's so rare that you get people in the room committed to the same thing, who are able to speak the treatment for all language in terms of improving patient outcomes and reducing the, the cancer burden in their country. We see success in some countries of which years ago would not have thought that they would reach this far. And that is what we are learning, that I am learning from the members of the UICC. 
people in Mexico doesn't have uh, medicines they need. So it's very important to make the patients and the government to understand the importance of equality in the case of treatments. Me llamo Verónica del Toro González, tengo 50 años. Bueno, hace 10 años fui diagnosticada con cáncer de mama. Eh, tuve después eh, um, cáncer metastásico en hueso, en pulmón, en cerebro. Actualmente estoy en tratamiento con quimioterapia y no sé por cuánto tiempo. <risa> Gracias a Fundación Salvati, una de ellas, este, me ha sacado de embrollos en muchas ocasiones. Otros países ya pasaron por donde estamos nosotros ahora. Ya tienen hecho todo un camino de donde hoy ya tienen estos tratamientos para, toda, eh, para todos sus habitantes. Entonces, aprender de otros países y saber qué es lo que hicieron, qué les funcionó y qué no les funcionó, nos va a ayudar muchísimo a llegar a nuestra meta mucho más rápido. Y en México, desgraciadamente, todavía no estamos en ese punto. Han mejorado mucho en los últimos años, pero seguimos necesitando tratamiento para todos. Pues yo le diría a, al gobierno que, que ponga más atención, que cuando piense en cáncer, piense en un problema que puede haber en su familia y cómo reaccionaría a ese problema. Y de esa manera que actuar. Y estando unidos, el gobierno, por supuesto, escucha una sola voz. Y por eso queremos transmitir eso a otros países, que cuando trabajamos en conjunto por una misma causa, vamos a trabajar mucho más rápido y, por supuesto, con mayores respuestas. Es algo que, como seres humanos, merecemos. Tener una muy buena calidad de vida, pero es necesario que se hagan inversiones eh, con un buen destino. You know, we've said that we want essential medicines available around the world, we want essential technologies around the world. Well, that's not going to happen without the treatment for all campaign, because we have to press governments to actually invest in that technology and invest in those essential medicines. The more we do something now, the more results we can gain. The urgency in terms of responding to the epidemic of cancer cannot be overemphasized. Join this program because it's great. I think it's what we need, what your patients need. You are not alone. People have succeeded and that we can succeed. Treatment for all is not impossible. So it's a must. This is not really a choice. It's a must. I call on the stage His Excellency Dr. Olgas Abisher, Vice Minister of Health of Kazakhstan, to please come and address our audience about next year's summit. Please come to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Royal Highness Princess Dina Myrat for the perfect opportunity to give a speech on the such marvelous event. I want to face and tell my speech about focused on um, participants of this summit. Dear leaders in the fight against cancer, for me it is a great honor and privilege to be here with such a reputable audience of leaders, oncologists, and politicians who have made an invaluable contribution to the fight against cancer, both in their country and in the world. Today's summit is an excellent indicator of the ability of UICC to mobilize the forces of the world community in the fight against cancer. The summit is organized at a high level, and we believe that it will be able to support both governments and non-governmental organizations. During the years of independence, Republic of Kazakhstan has built friendly and constructive relations with all countries, our closest neighbors, all who are interested in developing cooperation with our country. Our country is a member of UICC 
for the last 10 years. One of the priority key areas of the social policy of the Republic of Kazakhstan is the fight against cancer. Annually, cancer takes 15,000 lives. As a result, our country was faced with an epidemic caused by an increase in the incidence of cancer and mortality, in addition to a growing number of patients living with cancer. Along with success, successes in the fight against cancer achieved in the recent years, there are several issues that need to be addressed. First, insufficient cooperation between primary care and cancer centers in the implementation of anti-cancer measures. Second, insufficient financing of cancer care and low efficiency of funding mechanisms. Third, a low percentage of early stage cancer diagnosed in the state. And the last one, insufficient coverage of the population by screening. Dear friends, after the address of our president, Nusultan Nazarbayev, to the population of the state in 2017, the fight against cancer raised to a level of a nationwide campaign to solve the existing problems the cancer control plan from 2018 to 2022 has been developed and approved. The plan includes the development of prevention and management of risk factors, highly effective early diagnosis of cancer, the introduction of an integrated model of medical care that should provide access to cancer patients to the latest high-tech personalized methods of prevention, diagnosis, and treatment. Highly effective early diagnosis will be provided by increasing of coverage of breast, cervical, and colorectal cancer screening, first implemented 10 years ago. The opening of PET centers, development of nuclear medicine, and personalized molecular genetic testing. The radiotherapy equipment will be updated to increase the availability of radiotherapy in general with modern linear accelerators. On an ongoing basis, the clinical guidelines for the diagnosis and treatment of cancer will be improved and updated in accordance with the recommendations of international experts and societies like WHO, SCCO, ESMO, IAEA, etc. As I told before, uh, today I heard a lot of speeches about the importance of the primary health care and universal health care coverage in the uh, early detection of the oncology diseases. I want to share two directions right now implementing in our country. So first of all, this year we launched national project electronic health record for all our citizens for 18 million population. Right now we have 2.2 million EHR formed in the nationwide system which will allow us to implement the algorithms for early detection of oncology diseases. And right now, we have term, uh, intermediate results, which shows us uh, early detection increased for 12.8% compared to the last year. I hope it, will hope it will help us to find many possible oncology diseases on the very early stages. The second of all, we're implementing artificial intelligence like IBM Watson for Oncology and another machine learning algorithms to help our doctors in a better way to give diagnosis for our patients according to the latest oncology researches all over the world. On 25th and 26th October 2018, the world will come together in Astana, Kazakhstan at the Global Conference on Primary Healthcare to renew a commitment to primary health care to achieve universal health care coverage and sustainable development goals. The conference will, help, will be held in the Palace of Independence and is co-hosted by the government of Kazakhstan, WHO, and UNICEF. Today, the international community faces a difficult task to restore the balance of the power against such a complex and serious disease. We need to make every effort to ensure that future generations can develop without fear of dying from cancer. On behalf of Ministry of Healthcare, uh, we want to invite you to participate in the next World Cancer Leader Summit taking the place on October 14, 16, 2019 in Almaty City, Republic of Kazakhstan. I can talk by hours about the wonderful 
an astonishing Almaty city of my lovely country. But instead, I will give you a recommendation to open your mobile phones and open World Cancer Leader Summit application. You can find promotional video with invitation to visit next World Cancer Leader Summit in my country. I'm sincerely convinced that we are facing a difficult task and that only through joint efforts we can achieve it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Abishev, the Vice Minister of Health of Kazakhstan, and thank you also to Her Royal Highness Princess Dina Mariette for her final presentation and call to action. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor now to call upon the Honorable Deputy Minister of Health of Malaysia, Dr. Lee Bunjai, to give us the closing address for the World Cancer Leaders Summit 2018. Your Royal Highness, Excellencies, distinguished guests, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank the Union for International Cancer Control for inviting me to speak at this uh, closing of the summit. Uh, before I start my speech, I, it probably is not too late to say that welcome to Malaysia, welcome to new Malaysia. As you have witnessed, Malaysia has undergone a major change five months ago through a peaceful transition of government and created history because we have the oldest prime minister in the world, Tun Dr. Mahathir. By the way, he's a doctor himself. As a cardiologist, uh, myself, uh, as I walked into the Ministry of Health office uh, four months ago, and I realized that over the years, we have spent so much of resources in treating diseases and very much so little resources in preventing diseases. And the Honourable Minister, Dr. Zulkifli Ahmad, and myself both agree that I think it's time not just to mop the floor, but also should stop the tape from flowing. So more resources, we are committed to commit more resources in primary care and in preventive medicine and in managing uh, NCD, including uh, cancer, uh, better. A study by Harvard Medical School had reported that at least 50% of cancer deaths are preventable through lifestyle changes. I'm sure you are fully aware of this. And about 30% of cancer deaths are due to five leading behavioral and dietary risks, namely high body mass index, low fruit and vegetable intake, lack of physical activities, tobacco, tobacco use, and alcohol. And tobacco, tobacco use is probably the most important risk factor for cancer, causing over 20% of global cancer deaths and about 70% of global lung cancer deaths. In response to health effects of tobacco, the Ministry of Health Malaysia is strengthening our commitment to the Framework Convention of Tobacco Control and reducing access as well as use of tobacco. As we work towards adopting as well as implementing a Tobacco Control Act, our first step is to enable individuals to make healthy choices by creating an environment that empowers them to do so. So this includes enforcing smoke-free zones under the control of tobacco product regulations 2017, which announced, we announced uh, earlier this month. And uh, by January next year, uh, people will no longer be allowed to smoke in non-air conditioner eateries on top of those existing 
non-smoking areas surrounding hospitals, parks, elevators, government premises, as well as air-conditioned eateries, shops, and offices. We wish to shut down smoking rooms in Parliament by October, and this is to lead by example and to serve Malaysia in the best possible capacity. The other preventable cancer risk is infection. And we realise, of course, by like all, all of you do, uh, cancer-causing viral infections such as hepatitis B, hepatitis C, uh, HPV are responsible for up to 20% of cancer deaths, especially in low- and middle-income countries. Infections with these agents are potentially preventable through immunisation. Ladies and gentlemen, we know that cancer treatment requires tremendous amount of resources. Of course, I do take note that the theme for today's summit is cancer treatment for all. That, no doubt, will put a lot of pressure on the government of the day. We do hope that we just not just hope to get cancer treatment for all, but we do hope that everybody will strive to drive home that hopefully, especially the pharmaceutical company, to provide affordable cancer treatment for all. Because we know that with each innovation, the cost of treatment goes up and the impact on financial resources is large. As what Dr. Santari Somasundram from the National Cancer Society of Malaysia presented, being diagnosed and living with cancer in Southeast Asia can be disastrous, whether it is on a household level, in which they risk spending more than 30% of their household income on out-of-pocket expenses. In fact, in Malaysia, a study on Malaysian national health accounts, published in 2016, showed that out-of-pocket treatment is up to 39% of total health expenditure. Hence, having a cancer patient in the family may throw the whole family into irreversible and perpetual poverty and hardship. Cancer also got high impact at country level, in which we lose people who die from cancer and other non-communicable diseases in their productive years, as shown by earlier speaker, and which impede our economy and productivity. Of course, at global level, we do notice that, as what the previous speaker has mentioned, inequality in cancer treatment, which actually further widens the disparity between nations. There's the need for multi-stakeholder collaboration between governments, civil societies, academia, and private sector in achieving desirable outcomes. Last year, the successful adoption of cancer resolution, which is co-sponsored by Malaysia government, at the World Health Assembly, showed the world's commitment to act against these diseases. I won't go through some of the key drivers, but I would suffice to say that some of the key areas mentioned in the resolution are incorporated in the Malaysia's National Strategic Plan for Cancer Control and Prevention 2016-2020 and includes the relevant strategies for cancer control cutting across the continuum ranging from prevention, screening, early detection, diagnosis, treatment, rehabilitation, palliative care, research, traditional and complementary medicine, surveillance and monitoring. We have dedicated cancer centres in Malaysia, which has been built across the country, and chemotherapy services are widely available in public hospitals. We are back on track we are National Cancer Registry, having published the Malaysian National Cancer Registry 2007-2011 last year, and looking forward to publish the next 
uh, registry soon. Our subsequent steps in our national cancer control plan are to reduce the negative impact of cancer by decreasing the morbidity and mortality, and at the same time, to improve the quality of life of cancer patients and their families. The plan addresses specific issues in a goal-oriented, problem-specific and resource-appropriate manner. For successful implementation, we will make cancer and NCD control our priority and secure the funds and resources for it and place mechanisms for monitoring and evaluation. The cancer resolution also calls for promotion of the primary prevention of cancers and to integrate as well as scale up national cancer prevention and control as part of national response to non-communicable diseases. As we are making progress in prevention and treatment of cancers, palliative care and end-of-life care have somewhat fallen behind. In fact, for cancer patients, especially those patients in home, cure is not a feasible option or not a feasible goal of treatment. Improved quality of life is of paramount importance. This can be attained through provision of palliative care, prompt assessment, and treatment of pain and other problems which may be physical, psychosocial, or spiritual. Last but not least, we may be coming to an end to the end of the summit, but it is our sincere wish that this marks the start of new relationship, partnership, as well as collaborations. As we continue with the World Cancer Progress throughout the week, I encourage everyone to share your knowledge and best practices with us and hope that you will, you will in turn, gain insights into strengths and challenges faced by this region. I do, before I end, reiterate, it's good to have cancer treatment for all. But I do urge that, you know, we should also make sure that treatment for cancer is affordable for all so that the inequality will not persist between those who are rich and those who are poor. With that, I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honourable Dr. Lee Bun Chai, Deputy Minister of Health of Malaysia. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the 10th World Cancer Leaders Summit has come to an end, and it has been a wonderful, inspiring day with the wonderful contributions and discussions and a lot of thought-provoking ideas. I hope that you all have um, found it fruitful and have much to take back.